So Ajahn, please do begin when you're ready. Excellent. So welcome everybody to the um, this retreat and for this afternoon session for you. It's just uh, 12 noon and all the talks and conferences and the retreats which I've given, they always call the session after lunch, the graveyard shift. Because people usually, especially if you take eight precepts, have had a big lunch and all the blood goes to the belly, which means not much is left in the head to understand everything. So I always try to make the afternoon session a little bit more interesting. And of course, those who have seen the program have seen that we're going to be talking about the Anapanasati Sutta. And the Anapanasati Sutta, many people think they know it, but there's always other parts of it you may not have heard of before. To begin the Anapanasati Sutta, I'm going to begin with the origin story to the Anapanasati Sutta. Because the origin story is not found in the suttas, it's found in the Vinaya, where the Anapanasati Sutta comes from. So here it is, and it's a bit sort of, oh, well, you can make up your own judgments on what you think of it, but it certainly is interesting. So this comes from the third Parajika rule for the Bhikkhu Vinaya. So this is, <coughs> this is just like the suttas, it's valid, but it may be something you have not heard of before. At one time, the Buddha, the master, was staying at Vaisali in the hall with the peak roof in the great wood. At that time, the master talked in many ways to the monks on the subject of unattractiveness, what we call a super meditation. He spoke in praise of unattractiveness. He spoke in praise of developing the perception of unattractiveness. He spoke thus, and thus he spoke in many ways in praise of the attainment of unattractiveness. And my commentary on that is that a super meditation, where you see the unattractiveness, especially for other genders or the same genders, or possessions, or so many things, it makes you grow, so you're not attracted to anything, so you can let these things go very, very easily. Then the master addressed the monks. Monks, I want to go into solitary retreat for half a month. No one is to approach me except the one who brings me alms food. And that's exactly what we introduced in our monasteries and uh, also for venerable chanda. So every now and again, we can go into retreat and just have two weeks of solitude. And the only person you see is the one who cooks the food and brings it to you, if that's at all possible. And of course, I've done that many times, and it's a wonderful time for a monastic. Instead of serving and teaching, and even the Buddha did this, even though he's fully enlightened, still he went on these retreats as a good example for others to follow. Yes, Master, the monks replied, and accordingly, no one approached the Master except the one to take him alms food. Then the monks thought, when the Buddha was on retreat, the Buddha has talked in many ways on the subject of unattractiveness, a super. And they dwelt intent upon the practice of developing the perception of unattractiveness in its many different aspects. As a consequence, they became troubled by their own bodies, ashamed of them, loathing them, just as a young woman or man, fond of adornments and with head washed, would be ashamed, humiliated and disgusted if the carcass of a snake, a dog, or a man were hung around their necks. 
just so those monks were troubled by their own bodies, ashamed of them and loathed them. And as a result, they even took their own lives. They took the lives of one another and they approached Migalandika, who was a sham recluse, the recluse lookalike, and said, friend, please kill us and this bowl and robe will be yours. Then Migalandika, hired for the cost of a bowl and robe, killed a number of monks. He then took his bloodstained knife to the river Wagumuda. And while he was washing it, he became anxious and remorseful. Indeed, it's a loss for me. It's no gain. It's badly gained by me, not well gained. I have made much demerit because I have killed monks who were virtuous and of good conduct. Then a certain spirit of Mara's retinue, who followed Mara, walking across the water, said to Migalandika, well done, good man, it's a gain for you. It's well gained. You have made much merit because you have brought those across who have not yet crossed. They had a simile of crossing the stream, crossing the river, from you know, being an ordinary person to at least a stream winner, if not a, a more enlightened being. Then Migalandika thought, oh, so it seems it is a gain for me. That is well gained by me. And not I have made much merit by bringing those across who have not yet crossed. He then went from dwelling to dwelling, from dormitory to dormitory, and said, who has not yet crossed? Who do I bring across? And those monks who were not free from desire became fearful and terrified with their hair standing on end. I always wonder about that saying there because the monks were supposed to be bald. So it must be just the metaphor of hair standing on end, even if I haven't got any hair. But not so those who are free from desire. Then Migalandika killed a monk on a, a single day. Sometimes he killed two monks, three, four, up to 50 monks on a single day. And some days he killed even 60 monks. At the end of that half month, the Buddha arose from seclusion and addressed his attendant, Venerable Ananda. Ananda, why is the Sangha of monks so diminished? It is because the master talked to the monks in many ways on the subject of unattractiveness, asuba. He spoke in praise of unattractiveness, in praise of developing the perception of unattractiveness, and in many ways in praise of the attainment of unattractiveness. And master, those monks thought, the Buddha's taught about all of this, and because of that, they became troubled by their own bodies, ashamed of them, loathing them, just as a young woman or man uh, with head, uh, I suppose, groomed, would be ashamed, humiliated, and disgusted if the carcass of a snake, the carcass of a dog, even the carcass of a man were hung around their neck. So these monks were troubled by their own bodies, ashamed of them, loathing them. They took their own lives, took the lives of each other, and they approached Migalandika and said, please kill us for the bowl and robe. And that is why the number of monks in the Sangha have got much less. Whenever I go and retreat, I always have to make sure that I teach the monks something much better than that. <laughs> Otherwise, when I come out of retreat, <laughs> maybe the number of monks and nuns might be less. <laughs> well then, Ananda, call together, uh, call together in the assembly hall all the monks that dwell near Vesali. Yes, Master, he said. And when he had done so, he approached the master and said, Master, the Sangha of monks is assembled. Master, please do what you think is appropriate. <coughs> then a Buddha went to the assembly hall, sat down on a prepared seat and said, Monks, the stillness, the samadhi, 
by mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati. When developed and cultivated, it's peaceful and sublime, an exalted state of happiness. And it stops and settles bad, unwholesome qualities on the spot whenever they arise. Just as a big storm when it arises out of season in the last month of the hot weather, stops and settles the dust and dirt in the atmosphere. Even so, the stillness by mindfulness of breathing, when developed and cultivated, is peaceful and sublime, an exalted state of happiness, and it stops and settles bad, unwholesome qualities on the spot. And how is the stillness by mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated in this way? And then the Buddha goes on to teach Anapanasati. So that is actually, this is an early text. So this may have been where Anapanasati started from, or perhaps these were just monks who needed to be reminded of the superiority of Anapanasati, because some of the loathsome practices, the harsh practices, can get one so negative that one feels like just giving up the body and not looking after it. But I like the saying in the end, when he told all the monks, the monks which were left, the stillness by mindfulness of breathing, the samadhi, which is created by anapanasati, when developed and cultivated, is peaceful and sublime. Just like those words, so peaceful. And not just ordinary peace, but very sublime, a very high state of peace and an exalted state of happiness. These deep meditations, again, are blissful, exalted state of happiness. And it stops and settles bad and wholesome qualities on the spot. The unwholesome qualities of the mind, you know, things like anger, depression, being fed up, being tired, gets settled by Anapanasati. And just as a big storm when it arises out of season, stops and settles the dust and dirt in the atmosphere. Here in Perth, we're very fortunate to have had some, a couple of uh, big rains, which are totally out of season. Here in Western Australia, it's no middle of November, it should be summertime. It should even be the start of bushfires. But this year we've had some very good rain. And so it's quite cool during the daytime. And so because it's quite cool in the daytime, we've got some rain, everything is nice and humid, and it settles so many problems. I think I mentioned earlier that I do have problems with hay fever, but because of that rain, it's cleaned the atmosphere of the pollen. And so the hay fever is quite subdued. It's hardly there at all now. And because it's an exalted state of happiness and it settles bad unwholesome qualities of the spot, then you don't have the problem of monks getting so depressed that they just don't look after their bodies. So that's Anapanasati, the origin story to it. And uh, I'm now going to go on to explaining what Anapanasati is. And uh, before I start that, sometimes that people, when they're practicing meditation, sometimes they have a very perverse idea that don't worry about comfort, don't worry about pain, because real meditators can push through discomfort and pain. Just be tough. And I don't call that anapanasati. I give that another name, which is called anapanasati. Mindfulness along with pain. And that's not how the Buddha taught. And quite frankly, it's not very helpful. Anapanasati, mindfulness along with the breath, pana. Interestingly, the word breath, pana, is the same as the word for animals, living beings in Pali. This morning, when I gave the five, oh, five precepts, the first precept, I gave it in English, you may all know that precept as 
Upana Atipata, where Ramani Sikapadang Samadhyami. Atipata means destroying Pana. And Pana means living beings. So living beings means beings with breath. That's why the Pana breath, Anapanasati, and Pana Atipata. It's the same word in Pali. And for those of you who've studied some Latin at school, and I was talking with some of the monks over here, because you know, we teach Pali here, and that those monks who have gone to schools in Europe where Latin is taught have a distinct advantage. Because the Latin, the, the way it's uh, Latin is uh, formed and the way that Pali is formed is so similar. But I also mentioned when I learned Latin at school, on the desks that former students of Latin had scratched into the desk the following little poem, which I'm going to repeat now for your amusement. And the poem is this. This was written by a schoolboy struggling to learn Latin at a high school. Latin is a language as dead as dead could be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. <laughs> I always remember that from my school days. Latin is a language as dead as dead can be. First it killed the Romans, and now it's killing me. <laughs> That's quite tough. But anyway, you got your head around it. And thereby you learn so many lovely words, like pana. And the word for breath in Latin is animalis. Well, where we get the word animal from. An animal is something which has breath. Animalis is breath. So it's exactly the same structure, different word, but very close. So anyway, the Anapanasati means mindfulness of the breath. Mindfulness sati, along, Anapana. Ana means along with the breath. So here is the Anapanasati Sutta, or uh, the part of it, which uh, I'm going to read out this morning. Now, of course, with Anapanasati, if you look at the sutta, this is Machima Nikaya 118. And if you look at the sutta, there's a lot of repetition in there. And when you have the repetition, sometimes it puts people off reading the suttas, simply because it bores them. Now, I'm going to start with not the word of the Buddha, but with actually the uh, 118, this is the Pali Text Society's description of Anapanasati. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Megara's mother together with many very well-known elder disciples, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahamogalana, the Venerable Mahakasapa, the Venerable Mahakachana, the Venerable Mahakotita, the Venerable Mahakapina, the Venerable Mahachunda, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Revata, the Venerable Ananda, and other very well-known elder disciples. Now on that occasion, elder bhikkhus have been teaching and instructing new bhikkhus. Some elder bhikkhus have been teaching and instructing 10 bhikkhus. Some elder bhikkhus have been teaching and instructing 20, 30, 40 bhikkhus. And it goes on like that for a couple of pages before it actually gets on to the heart of the sutta about the Anapanasati itself. And sometimes the repetition gets so much and it doesn't really get to what people really want to hear, which is what is Anapanasati? How do you do it? And what does it result in? So because of that, that I have abbreviated so much to make this Anapanasati Sutta much more powerful, hopefully. And so this is not what you've heard before, unless you've seen me do this before. It is more concise, hopefully without losing any necessary information so people can practice this with greater ease. So this is from 118. And it is 
saying that mindfulness of breathing developed and cultivated produces so much benefit. But in particular, it completes the four focuses of mindfulness, the Satipatthana. And the reason I chose this version to present to you is because there is a myth, I say a myth, it's false as you can see in this sutta. The myth is that Satipatthana means Vipassana meditation and Anapanasati means Samatha meditation. And those two are contrasted, as if Samatha is one thing and Vipassana is another thing. Samatha means like calm, peace, being still. Vipassana is insight, getting some understanding, what's going on. And sometimes people feel that these two are totally different. And this particular sutta, said by the Buddha, makes it abundantly clear to anyone who is willing to listen to it and read it, that there is no difference at all. That Satipatthana and uh, Anapanasati, Samatha Vipassana, go together. So it says, how does mindfulness of breathing develop and cultivate complete the four Satipatthanas, four focuses of mindfulness. And how does the four focuses of mindfulness, the Satipatthana, complete the seven enlightenment factors? So the Buddha is saying, Anapanasati completes, fulfills the seven, the four focuses of mindfulness, the four Satipatthana, and it also fulfills the seven enlightenment factors. So mindfulness of breathing is a complete practice leading all the way to enlightenment according to the word of the Buddha. So how does mindfulness of breathing do this? And mindfulness of breathing is uh, analyzed or separated into four parts. And 16 stages in all. I call them stages, I don't like the word stages because a stage is sometimes you complete one stage and then you go on to the next stage. Just like you, you know, in a football tournament, you complete round one and if you win, you go into round two. And if you complete round two, then you go to round three. This is not what is meant here. What is meant here is after completing stage one, you go inside stage one to stage two, inside stage two to stage three. You never go on to the next stage. You go inside where you're at now to get to the next stage. It's a totally different way of looking at stages, which is one of the reasons why I gave the simile of the flower opening, the thousand petal lotus. Whatever part of the lotus you're on right now, the next stage of that lotus is right in the middle of where you are now. You open up the lotus, open up this lotus petal, and you're aware of the next layer of petals inside. When they open up, you go into the next layer of petals, stage by stage by stage. And just to go on developing that simile a bit further for you, is the way that the lotus opens up is when it receives the warmth and the light from the sun. And the warmth and light from the sun in this simile of opening up your body and mind and going inside, the warmth and light of the sun represents the kindness, that's the warmth, the light, the awareness, the mindfulness, the sati. So with mindfulness and kindness, that opens you up. You go inside, deeper and deeper and deeper, one stage after another. This is like the how Anapanasati works. And Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breathing, is showing you just what happens. 
when you are kind and aware. So, the first four stages in um, Asterix. When the in-breath and out-breath are long, and you are aware that they are long. The in-breath and out-breath are short, and you are aware that they are short. You learn to experience the hold of the breath as you breathe in and out. You learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. Those are the four stages. Now that's the way I like to translate them. And how translating word by word is, breathing in long, you understand I breathe in long. Breathing out long, you understand I breathe out long. Breathing in short, you understand I breathe in short. Breathing out short, you understand I breathe out short. So just use modern English. When in breath and out breath are long, you know they're long. When in breath and out breath are short, you know that they are short. Just that amount. Now, this is how the Buddha said it. But does that really mean that you have to breathe in a short breath? And what actually is a short breath? You have to breathe out a long breath. What is a long breath? And sometimes you look at your breath, is it long or is it short? In truth, uh, most of the time, my breath is somewhere in between. My natural breath, not forcing it, but just being aware and being kind. And the point is that these two stages do not need to be done, this one and then that one. Either one is sufficient. All this first two stages of Anapanasati mean is that you are aware of your breath and you are aware of one other quality of the breath, such as its length, just to make it easier for you to maintain your awareness on the breath. When you first start doing breath meditation, just being aware of the breath is not enough to keep you from drifting off. So by making it a little bit more interesting, is it a short breath, a long breath, or in between? And of course, those of you who have done breath meditation before know there are many, many, many alternatives to just long or short, to the length of the breath. Sometimes we do these, what we call the mantras, like little words which you say to yourself. Now you don't speak them out loud, you say them inside. Such as, uh, one of the most common ones in the Thai forest tradition was saying Buddho. As you breathe in, you say to yourself, Bud, as you breathe out, To, Buddho, Buddho, with each breath. In breath, Bud, out breath, To. And of course, I practiced like that because I was in Thailand and that's what all those teachers would advise you to do. But then when I started teaching in Australia, that really didn't work that well. For a Thai person, or maybe even, I'm not sure, Sri Lankan person, maybe a Burmese person, even the word Buddha, it has a lot of emotional weight to it. So it's very easy to, you know, well, it's not easy, but it's very important to say and easy to gain your respectful attention. The saying Buddha, Buddha, Buddha does help the mind settle its awareness on the breath. But of course, you know, in places like Australia and in England, just saying Buddha along with the breath was not that successful. So I experimented many times. And one of the things which I did to experiment with, because I knew that people would always think too much, was as you breathe in, don't say the word butto, to actually to say the word shut. And as you breathe out, up. Shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> which was amusing, but then it didn't really work for people. So there's many other ways. And one other way, which I was just talking with Venerable Chandra just before we came online here, was 
something which it came from Thailand as well, is as you breathe in, you say to yourself, die. And as you breathe out, ne, die, ne, die, ne. And I translated that into Indonesian for some Indonesian meditators, and they really liked it because it was very clear and peaceful. It was, as you're breathing in, you say to yourself, mati, as you breathe out, pasti. Mati, pasti. In English, it means, I will die, breathe out, that's for sure. <laughs> I will die, that's for sure, as you're breathing in out. Because it's something, it's like a truth which no one can deny. And also, it carries the, uh, the requirement that you're going to have to let go sooner or later. And as you let go, you can't take stuff with you. I think it's, it's half an hour now. So it's time for the first joke of the afternoon session. There was like a lawyer, an English lawyer who was very, very smart. And as he was getting old, dying, <coughs> he thought, <coughs> excuse me, he thought, I've worked so hard for all my money, all my wealth. It's really unfair that I can't carry it with me. So he started to contemplate how he can carry his cash with him into his next life. So he came up with a brilliant idea, an ingenious idea. Just when he was on his deathbed, he told his wife, ordered his wife, to go to the bank and get as much of his amazing amount of wealth out of the bank and put it into two big suitcases, you know, in high denomination notes. And then after she's got those money in the suitcases, to put them in the attic above his bed, placed precisely above his bed. So when he dies and leaves his body, he can actually grab those suitcases on his way up to heaven. So his wife, diligent wife, said, okay, darling, I'll do that for you. It's a bit stupid, but if that's what you want, that's what I'll do. And so she got two big suitcases, filled them full of cash, dragged them into the attic and positioned them right above her husband's body on his bed. And of course, a bit later, the husband died, passed away. They did all the funeral ceremonies and stuff. And afterwards, she went into the attic and found out those two big suitcases were still exactly where she placed them, full of cash. And she said to herself, stupid old husband, he should, he should have put those two suitcases in the room underneath his bed, because I know which way he was going. Down. <laughs> Sometimes when you, when you tell funny stories or jokes online, you can't see people. So I don't know if you got that joke. I hopefully you did. Anyway, I, <laughs> Red or Chad got the joke. I can't see people's faces, so... Yeah, good. Okay, went down. Very good. Thank you so much. So anyway, um, I will die, that's for sure. It means you can't take things with you. It allows you to let go much more so that you can stay with your breathing much easier. But these days, for those two first stages of anapanasati, of knowing whether your breath is long or short, instead of just saying, uh, long or short, or I will die, that's for sure. I've experimented and found the most effective little words you may say when you're watching your breath, or starting to watch your breath, are breathing in peace. Or if you're sickly, health. If you're tired, energy. Breathe in something which is beautiful, which you really need. But it's not just saying the word to yourself. It's imagining what peace is, feeling peace, or using a, a metaphor for peace, like a dove coming into your heart as you're breathing in. If it's health, just imagining just a, a, a fit, 
free from pain body and breathe that health in as you breathe in. And you have to repeat it many times. And actually, people find that for forgetting healthy. Or if it's, um, and I'm oh, sorry, as you breathe out, when you're out of breath, breathe out, let go. And you can specify, you want to let go of things like your sicknesses or your worries or your concerns. Breathe in peace, breathe out, let go. And you really imagine these things happening as you are breathing in and breathing out. And because you're making the breath important, it's not just breath, it's something more valuable to you than that. It's your life, it's your success, your happiness, your health, all of those things you value a lot. So adding that to the meditation, breathing in peace, breathing out like her, makes it easier to watch your breath. Now, breathing in long, breathing in short, those are classical methods of meditation, which have been used for centuries. And once you've done that, you find your mind is pretty settled on your breathing. You just stay just watching your breath. And then you do the next stage of the meditation, which is uh, when you learn to experience the whole breath. In other words, you're not just watching in-breath and out-breath anymore. There is no such thing as just an in-breath. It starts at the very beginning, just a slight movement of air coming in, into your nostrils and going right into your body. And it picks up its, its maximum input of air. And then it suddenly, actually for me anyway, it pretty quickly fades away and stops. You see the whole process of breathing from beginning to end. Just as a little um, metaphor, I've got this little pen here. So this is like my breath. It goes, sorry, where is it? Goes from left to right, and then right to left. You don't just see just right and then left. It just starts in the very beginning. So it will move all the way right to the end. You see it at the end and it pauses, goes all the way out again. Breathing in, breathing out. Now I'm not gonna hypnotize you to get funds for the Anakapa Bikuni project. So I'll put the pen down now. But that's just a simile for watching the breathing. So you see from the very beginning to the very end. And that's you know, exactly the same when you do walking meditation later on. In walking meditation, you're watching the, the feet move from the very beginning of the rising of the foot. And just the way that the leg rises, does it go straight up? You know, I've done walking meditation for so many years. My foot, as it moves up, it goes up and then it goes backwards. It curves backwards. And then when it's raised above the floor, it goes forward in an arc. It doesn't go straight forward. And then it goes down. And you can feel all the different sensations in just one foot moving. It's not just left, right, left, right. You see the whole body of foot moving. So you can see the mindfulness is increasing. It's seeing many more, many more things. It's the same with the breath. The difference between stage two, one and two and three is you're picking up more sensations of the breath. Now, I know that some people, and honestly, I just can't understand why they keep saying this because it's totally contradicted by the Buddha. Is they think that at this stage, at stage three of Anapanasati, you're suddenly aware of your whole body, physical body. And it does say sabba, which means all, the whole body. And this is ridiculous. You're not being aware of your tummy or your toes or your left ear lobe. It means you're aware of the whole breath. And the problem comes for not truly understanding the depth of the Pali language. The word here in Pali is kaya. 
And kaya is used for so many different things, not just the physical body. You may know it, you know, for the that Thai group, the Dhamma, Dhammakaya. Or even like Manukaya, the body of a mentality. Just the same way that in English we say a body of troops or a body of evidence. And it's party word is used exactly the same way. It means a group, an accumulation of stuff. And this is the accumulation. The kaya here, the accumulation of experiences just in one in-breath or one out-breath. Seeing the whole body of that. And the Buddha even says that in uh, experiencing the whole body, sapakaya pati sangwedi, this refers to experience the whole breath. And the Buddha says it because that a body in the, so the breath is a body in the category of bodies. In other words, the Buddha explains it. That's what it's supposed to mean. It's a natural process. You go from just watching the in-breath and the out-breath to the whole of the in-breath, the whole of the out-breath. And that shows that, you know, your mindfulness is increasing in power. I will say this many times, but during this retreat, but I saw on a BBC uh, article about hermits, mostly over in Scotland, or I think one was in Wales. And these hermits uh, who live in solitude for such a long time in simple huts, they develop what uh, the psychologists call enhanced awareness. Or no, sorry, enhanced perception, I think they called it. And enhanced perception meant that when the wind blew over the, uh, the highlands, they could feel it so much more than an ordinary person. It wasn't just a cold wind. It was tingling and they felt so much of it. It was like the whole body of wind. And if the rain came, it wasn't just worried about getting drenched. It's almost like you feel every drop. And it's amazing just how beautiful that is. Or, you know, what I always quote is, um, the great, <coughs> sorry, the great English poem, poet, William Blake. And he was also an artist. And in his poem, he would say, to see a world in a grain of sand, a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, or eternity in an hour. And this was describing, this was, what was it, 17th century British poet, mystic, painter. This was actually showing just what happens with enhanced perception. When the mind sees so much more than usual, feels more. And what it feels is far more beautiful and delightful than ordinary perception, ordinary awareness. And that's exactly what happens when you're doing the breath meditation. You see more of the breath from the very beginning to the very end and the gaps in between. And it's not something which you do, it's something which happens. A sign your mindfulness is getting strong. And then the last part of this first session that, uh, you learn to calm the breath as you breathe in and out. You don't calm the breath, you learn to calm the breath. So how does the breath become calm? A lot of times, you know, you know, so your science, I hope, your biology, if your metabolism goes down, you don't need to breathe so much. You know, you don't need to, to use so much petrol in your car, you know, if it's just stop to the traffic lights. So just by relaxing your activities, the breath becomes calm. And this is an important point because when you're not thinking, you're not planning, you're not moving, quite naturally your breath becomes very calm. And one of those stories which I like to introduce at this point is those days when I first went to Thailand and 
staying with Ajahn Chah, and he liked to meditate outside in the evenings from 6 to 8 p.m. And of course, 6 to 8 p.m. in the jungle monasteries of Thailand, it was mosquito dinner time. And I thought, I don't know how he managed to do this. This was, was without any protection from mosquito nets or mosquito coils or um, insect repellent. There was no protection at all. And he would sit very peacefully, and so would the other monks. When I sat out there, you got devoured by mosquitoes. It was only fortune that there was no, um, no malaria in that area. It was still very, very um, irritating being bitten by mosquitoes. And when you complain to Ajahn Chah, he said, call those mosquitoes your teachers. The trouble with Ajahn Chah, he was always right in weird ways. So you couldn't really complain too much. You went back and sat there. And you had a choice to do your meditation properly. You know, to calm your body, start watching your breath, and really watching your breath. For the very beginning of an in-breath, the very end of an in-breath, the gap between, and when the in-breath has finished, the out-breath has not yet begun. You see the out-breath, from the very beginning of the out-breath to the end of the out-breath. You know, after a while, it was just so amazing. You focused totally on the breath, and you weren't aware of anything else. You couldn't feel the mosquitoes. If your mind wandered, it wouldn't wander off to some fantasy. You wouldn't fall asleep. It would wander off to your arm or your head, which was being bitten. But when you actually just watch the breathing, the beginning to end, really getting into it, you couldn't feel the mosquitoes biting you anymore. And the weird thing, the strange thing for me, was when you came out of that meditation, you looked at your arm and your shoulder, which were all exposed in Thailand, and there were no mosquito bites. And I mentioned this to Venerable Chanda before. I thought, wow, this is real psychic powers. I mean, really useful ones. Flying through the air, reading people's minds, that's pretty boring. But being able to avoid mosquito bites, that's something which is useful. That's a psychic power which I'd love. <laughs> but obviously afterwards I found it wasn't a psychic power at all. It was just nature. Because as I was watching my breath not doing anything, my whole metabolism was really calming down. I wasn't breathing very much. Didn't need to. Everything was so still inside which meant that I was not metabolizing, which meant that I was not uh, giving out much carbon dioxide, which is what attracts the mosquitoes. The more carbon dioxide comes out of your pores, the more you're saying to the mosquitoes, hi hey guys, here I am, come over here. So because there was no hardly very low metabolism, the mosquitoes couldn't even find me. And that's where I survived quite comfortably. So the meditation taught you so much about just how to be able to watch your breath and calm everything down and become so peaceful inside. And of course, there's much more to this breath meditation than that. But that's actually you know, where I'm going to finish in a couple of minutes. And so we can actually do a little bit of meditation for 15, 20 minutes, just as a little bit of a break, and then we do some Q&A on the Sutta so far. And in just brief, to sum up, this is just the beginning of Anapanasati. And just, it's something which does create stillness, does create happiness, and does allow you to go deep inside the mind. First of all, you will actually, uh, I didn't mention the uh, other part of Anapanasati. Where is, yeah, which is here a meditator goes to the forest or to the root of a tree to an empty hut, sits down having folding their legs crosswise, body erect, establish mindfulness as a priority, 
and mindfully breathe in, mindfully breathe out. Now, so I should have said that before, but mindfulness is a priority. It doesn't mean mindfulness in front of you. What does in front of you mean? Where do you exist? So you don't exist behind your nose. You can't say mindfulness in front of you here. Not like in the, some of the traditions, mindfulness of your belly as it goes up and down, meditating. The word in front of you is a bad translation of the Pali word. It means as a priority, to put it in front metaphorically, the most important thing to do to establish mindfulness first. And then you can watch the breath pretty easily. And in the guided meditation, you'll hear how that is done. So once that mindfulness is established, watching the breath, go in and go out until you get full awareness of the breath, calming it down. And even that much is really a beautiful, peaceful meditation. So that's enough for the Anapanasati Sutta part one. And there'll be many more parts. When I used to be a kid in England, I used to go to the Saturday morning pictures and it always ends. See what happens next in the next episode of Anapanasati. <laughs> okay, so if you want to just have a quick stretch for one minute or two, and then we do a guided meditation for 10 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or wobbly minutes. I'm just getting that by looking at Venal Chandler's picture. So about 10 or 15 minutes. So here we go. And hopefully I made that alive enough on the graveyard shift. I'm pretty tired, I had a busy day today. But nevertheless, I hope you got some important parts out of that sutta. You didn't get so scared by its origin story. So sit it down. Becoming aware of your body. We're gonna do a quick relaxation because I wanna get into a bit of breath. So how your legs feel right now? Good job I asked that question because my legs were not properly not comfortably situated on the on the chair. It's amazing. If you don't pay attention, the legs can be in all sorts of weird positions and cause you discomfort later on. Get my legs nice because I care for them. Get my butt. I'm going to fidget now rather than later. My back. Give it a good stretch. <clears throat> Today I feel like leaning back against the, the back breast. Relax my shoulders. Awareness down the arms to the hands. Making sure the head is well balanced on top of the neck. Relaxing all the muscles on my face. I like that because that lets go of a lot of any negative emotions. You, you cannot sort of uh, hide them when you're watching the muscles on your face. You can't pretend they don't exist because you can feel the tightness. So relax everything there. When all those muscles are relaxed, I really feel like doing this, taking my brain out of its box again. Because I've been abusing my brain today, doing a bit too much. So I'm going to take it out, put it in the box and rest it. I imagine my brain again. Thank you. And then feeling my whole body sitting here. Relaxed to the max. Not as relaxed as it was in the earlier meditation today. It's not bad. 
feeling the peace. The openness, the ease. Just sitting here in my body. I continue to relax it until I start to feel some delight, some happiness. The next 10, 12 minutes, I don't have to exert my body at all. Can I allow it to take a rest, to heal, re-energize? Once my body is reasonably peaceful, imagine going inside to my mind. I developed one part of the mind, one characteristic of it, called the amount of peace or disturbance. I call this the peaceometer, for want of a better word. I look at my mind, how peaceful is it or how agitated? And I've often investigated what makes my mind more agitated, what makes it more peaceful. And I've found by my own experience, let alone from being confirmed in the suttas, that any thought, any perception of the future disturbs my mind. I realize that now is where the future is being made. If I really want to have some peace and a very comfortable, happy future, I should put all my attention in the place where it's being made right now. And any thoughts of the past, the past cannot be changed. And I don't learn much from the past not as much as I learn from the present moment. Now is where the wisdom is. Because I know the past and the future, they both disturb my mind. They tire me. So I look at my peaceometer, knowing the past and the future, and what disturb. When I let those two go, just in this moment, just right now, here I find peace. And right in the center of this moment, you find silence. And only when I have silent present moment awareness, that is one of the two most important parts of mindfulness for me. Being now, being quiet. Just like relaxing my body when I have silence and present moment awareness. It's nice, it's delightful, it's pleasant. I just notice the pleasure of silent present moment awareness. Which means that that silence, that present moment, being regarded as a very beautiful, comfortable place to stay, is protected and it lasts. I don't need to think about the future. I don't need to think about anything because it's much more pleasant being silent in the now. To me, that's establishing mindfulness as a priority. So now I can become aware of my breathing. Can you feel yourself breathe in and breathe out? To find a simile, it's like people going on a warm day 
go to the ocean side and sit by the beach. And just I can see the waves come up the beach and then go back again. It's calm, very gentle waves. The air coming into your body and going out again. Being aware of the in-breath, aware of the out-breath. And if you want, as you breathe in, imagine something really important coming in with your in-breath. Breathing in peace, health, joy. Imagine it coming into your body and into your heart with every in-breath. As you breathe out, let go of any burdens, any heaviness which you might have been accumulating. Breathing in peace, breathe out, let go. Always in the present moment. Breathing in peace. Get out, let go. Make sure breathing in. See if you can notice even more parts of one in-breath, not just in, out, in, out, but the beginning of the in-breath, the middle, the end of the in-breath. You can notice the space in between, if there is any for you, when the in-breath has stopped, and the out-breath is yet to start. So with the out-breath, you can see it building up in just one out-breath, then fading away. And then a gap between the out-breath and the in-breath. This is full awareness of the breathing. See if you can even see the hold of the breath, continual flow of sensations from the beginning of the in-breath right to the very end of the in-breath. No gaps. And even when the in-breath stops, just the sensation of knowing it stopped before the out-breath begins. Seeing a continual awareness, which is one in breath and one out breath from beginning to end. That by itself calms the breathing. It becomes effortless because it becomes Delightful. The mind just loves doing this. How do you feel now? 
just to be aware of the general state of peace in your mind and the degree of relaxation in your body. Sometimes it feels just so beautiful. Often as a teacher, just, it's a struggle for me to come out. So feel your body now. Relax at ease at peace, I hope. And open your eyes to end the meditation. Brilliant. Okay. Oh, I enjoyed that. Only 15 minutes, so it's nice. So now we have some Q&A, some questions. So have you got any questions there for us? Yes, oh, for I do have some questions. So for anyone who's yeah, not so. aware about the question, you may write your question to Anne-Marie. So if you just click on, I don't know, go into the chat box, click on your name, I think. I'm not sure. Anyway, you, you'll figure it out and you write your question to Anne-Marie, she'll forward them to me and I'll just take a couple of questions. Yeah, can you mention the names as well? Because okay. I noticed a couple of names coming up. They're just good old friends. Sure. I haven't seen them for yeah, a while. Absolutely. So from Patricia, I did a lot of jhana practice a few years ago, but stopped being able to function properly in everyday life. Thinking became very slow and I had to quit my job. What went wrong? And how can I stop this happening again? Many thanks. Well, it's sometimes that... Uh, the practice of jhanas is something which has always been common in the monastic traditions. But it was a good example of this it's in Vietnam, that the United Buddhist Sangha there, which was both Theravada and Mahayana, they met together and made a resolution not to teach jhanas to lay people. That's what they said. And I rebelled against that and started teaching jhanas to anybody because I found that lay people can do this and why not but if since that time the jhanas have become quite even not popular but people know about them and they want to try and experience them and the problem is that I'm not sure that many people they say they've attained jhanas they haven't not the real thing I'm sure that later on in this retreat, I'll talk more in depth about the jhanas. But the real jhanas, when they happen, it, it means it abolishes what we call the five hindrances of like wanting and ill will or negativity, sloth and torpor and restlessness and doubt. Your mind becomes very, very poised and very powerful. And in the Nalakapana Sutta, it says the extra things, it abandons discontent and weariness. And I love where the Buddha was pointing down that a jhana abolishes weariness. Because you know, many of us work you know, over much. You know, Venerable Chanda, you work too hard, you know that, you told me about that many times, and I totally agree with you there. And I do that too. But you know, there are times you can go have a beautiful meditation and you come out afterwards like you're, you're, you're totally charged up. Weariness is gone. And that is a beautiful state where you can really teach because you know, you've got energy coming through all your pores and your brain is working at, with all its pistons firing. And that's what happens when you get a, a nice deep meditation. So that happens you know, in... Uh, teaching the Dhamma. So if you say that after meditation, after deep challenge, you couldn't function properly, this, I'm not quite sure what's going on there because you should have incredible energy and lots of, uh, lots of uh, intuition and innovation. You can see things which other people haven't seen and lots of joy as well. 
they're not quite sure you know what your functioning was if you're just working in a pub or working in a casino that might be impossible to function there because there's something which doesn't fit in with you know your appreciation of of goodness there's so many other places as lay people you can function pretty well you're actually much better than usual so maybe that you know what you've been experiencing is not the real jhanas when people come and ask me, was this a jhana, was this not a jhana? Sometimes I don't even ask what they experience, but I look at, see how they feel right now. And if they've got really powerful energy and they can see a world in a grain of sand, a, a heaven and a wildflower, that sort of stuff, and just lots of joy, lots of power. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a jhana. It's likely to be one anyway. So you're not dulled out. Yeah, so we, you can be a little bit... Uh, turned off from the world, not really interested so much. It's pretty easy to turn yourself back to your duties in life. Okay. Thank so you, Ajahn. Brief answer, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's quite a few questions, so I'm not sure we'll get to everybody's question, but one okay. that I thought was uh, important. Uh, someone's asking, Sabuk is asking, why is it so important to start meditation by relaxing the body? Because if you don't relax the body to begin with, the body will cause you problems and troubles afterwards. With the body, it's the five senses. Seeing or sight, um, hearing, smell, taste, and especially physical touch. And one of the, the jobs of meditation is to let those go, to transcend, go beyond the five senses to the mind. So you get to understand what the mind is and its beauty and its power. So if you've still got the five senses happening, you haven't let them go, you can't get into jhanas, you can't get into deep meditation. You're just on the outside. So those five senses have to be discarded. Just only temporarily, you come back to them afterwards and you're much healthier afterwards. But to be able to let go of those senses is important, which is one of the reasons just why. You know, you just have to let go in this way. Okay. So I'm putting a couple of questions together now. Um, yeah. One person saying that sometimes they find the concept of letting go, in a sense, more inviting so, to the point where they're letting go even of the breath or even before they get onto the breath. And another person is saying that they find meditation deeper and more joyful when they don't watch the breath. Great. So could, yeah. you, could you comment on that? Certainly, the breath is only one way of meditating. Even uh, to my monks last night, I gave a talk and the subject was on, on peace. It was <laughs> so many years ago, a boyfriend of one of the nuns over in Thailand just came to see her and said, what is all this, you know, this uh, transformation of vegetables about? What are you talking about? She said, because my girlfriend has always been calling me and telling me that May all beans be peas. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, not all beans be, I mean, all bean beings be peaceful. <laughs> but any, anyway, that this, I gave this sort of a meditation on peace. Just, okay, let's do it. You just say the word peace. 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 You feel peace. I'm not going to do any more because there's too many questions. But every time you say that, the mind will just go towards looking at peace. And then when that, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, after the word has been said, and you say it again when that's weak, you say it again when that's weak, and soon it gets so strong that what that word peace is pointing to, you can feel it. You know it. And I was doing that last night. Oh, again, some great meditations that way. You feel the peace, and then just the peace grows. And the peace is in a state of the mind, it's not of the body. And so the whole body just disappears. You go to deep, peaceful states inside the mind. There's many ways into the meditations, and you have to let go of the breath, even in Anapanasati. Next tomorrow, when you go to the next stage of Anapanasati, you start to not look at the breath. 
We look at the joy and happiness from the breath. And then that disappears in the ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th stages. That's when you get into the jhana stuff. So it's not, you're not aware of the breath when you're in your jhanas. Even, even in the fourth jhana, the breath stops. You're not breathing. Yee! You're perfectly alive there. But anyway, that's, that's a little taster, teaser for what's coming up in the next couple of days. <laughs> the whole intention was to stop everyone breathing, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> Not stop everyone breathing, but just allow the body to become so still and peaceful. Okay, I don't know if you know this story, you asked this, but sort of alluded to it. When Ajahn Chah, he had a stroke, so he couldn't teach anymore. And many people were wondering what he was actually doing when he was laying there in his bed, not able to teach. But a few times that there were monks in attendance on him, a few times Ajahn Chah stopped breathing while he was you know, on that to bed. And on this one occasion, the medic on duty, like a doctor on duty, freaked out. Ajahn Chah is not breathing. And the monk said, oh, he's just meditating, leave him alone. And the doctor refused to admit that because he didn't want Ajahn Chah to die on his shift. So they came to this compromise that the doctor would take blood samples every few minutes to make sure the blood was oxygenated even though Ajahn Chah was, couldn't see him breathing at all. And Ajahn Chah did this quite successfully for a couple of hours, three hours, whatever. He wasn't breathing at all, but his blood was always well ox oxygenated. It's a sign that he was meditating, a deep meditation. Not dead, but just so still he didn't need to breathe. His blood was fully oxygenated. Interesting little piece of research. And you ask sometimes, why can't that research be published? And the answer is because no one would believe it. It's just too challenging for many medical researchers. There's many stories like that. So, yeah, after a while, you don't need to breathe. Petrol is turned off for a while. You're perfectly healthy, perfectly, and actually you're blissing out. Are you ready for another question? Yeah, yeah, come on, yeah. All right. So Rob is asking, how can the concept of non-self help us to stay with the breath? Oh, great, because non-self means you've got nothing to do, nothing to achieve, nowhere to go. It means you've got less work to do. Remember, understanding non-self, there's no one in here, which means you've got nothing to do. Why do you work so hard? Why do you think so much? And why are you worried about achieving this or failing at that? You know, that's all part of the sense of self. And so after when you let go of the sense of self, no one in here, nothing to achieve. All the obstacles to breath meditation are taken away. You find that the cause of disturbances is removed, the deep cause of disturbances. The sense of self is known as that which owns things and controls things. Don't look at the sense of self as some philosophical concept. This is the thing which makes you do stuff, which owns and controls and is afraid of failure and just wants to achieve things and get things. When that sense of wanting things and not wanting things disappears, so do you you find that you vanish, which means that there's nothing else to do except just watch the breath. This removing the obstacles to breath meditation. People always say, I'm watching the breath, I can't stop thinking. What are you thinking about? Why do you think? The sense of self is like a lake and the thoughts are the waves on top of the lake, the ripples. That's what the thoughts are. So the thoughts start to soften, the lake vanishes, and there's no need to think. 
you can't think. That's where the, when you read it, and if you don't understand and, and penetrate at least some part of the sense of self, you get scared, you get terrified of meditation because you're, you're disappearing. To get into a jhana, most of you has to go. I don't want to go. We want to jhana. Unfortunately, that you have to go. <laughs> it's nice to let go of yourself. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Chamath has a question. Um, they're asking, is it necessary to think of a present moment or is not letting go of past and future sufficient? Isn't the concept of present moment from the Visuddhi Magga and not found in the suttas? It's found in the suttas. In the Padeka Rata Sutta, Pachupana Dhamma, that's the, time, that's the Pali word for it. So it's found in the suttas, but this is just what happens. If you focus on the present moment, it's a pre present abiding, and of course the past and the future disappears. Or you can let go of the past and the future, and then the present moment is all that's left. It's, it depends on what you really want to do. You can focus on the good, and, or you can let go of the bad. Both lead to the same thing. So I'm going to put two questions together, probably yeah. to the end of question time, because one of them is a little bit longer. Um, so one person's asking about if their mind is tense and they feel that it's difficult to go to the breath, is it okay to practice with the body sensations and to practice putting the causes in place, like kindness and loving kindness? And another person's asking, what is the best way to use our personal practice time? Oh, yeah. There's, again, I totally agree with that's much better than just going to the breath. So let the breath come to you. Don't go to the breath. And quite frankly, I've said this many times, and you know this, Renal Chanda, by your own conversations with me, that I never go looking for the breath. I just calm my mind down. So my body, first of all, really relaxing it. Then my mind, really relaxing my mind, coming to the present moment. And then just the breath is there. I don't seek it. It's just what's left when everything else disappears. As I watch the breath, I just let my mind do what it wants to do. I don't rush it. I haven't got any sort of um, uh, times I have to finish this by. I've got to get this. I, that sort of stuff is not relaxation at all. And in uh, summary, I just make peace. Be kind and gentle. And part of being gentle is being patient, not rushing anything. And just after a while, the mind gets pretty peaceful. Sometimes it doesn't go to the deepest states, but it always gets some lovely meditations. And just give it the time and things happen. So I literally get out of the way and let things, let things occur. And if they don't occur as fast because I got disturbed, I got tired or something, that's fine too. It will happen. So present moment, just being content with this. That's the best way. So thank you, Ajahn. And just wondering if you do have some uh, suggestions for how to use the personal practice time. We have about six hours now between this session and my oh, yeah. evening session that I'm going to leave for everyone. Yeah. So uh, have you any advice or suggestions for that? Yes, just experiment, innovate, so don't just do what I say. Or don't just follow what you say. Don't even follow what the Buddha says. Just try and see what works for you. And be rebellious. And what happens, I'll just recount my own experience. You try your own way, try what works, find out what happens. And after a while, you find, oh my goodness, that's exactly what the Buddha said. <laughs> You find out afterwards, but you didn't really understand what the Buddha was saying before. So after a while, you get very peaceful. Try this, try that, try different postures, do walking meditation. I didn't explain walking meditation at, at length, but by doing just the same as you do sitting meditation, be aware of your feet as they move and go forward. Choose a path, a simple path, and just walk to the end of the path, turn around and walk back again. And little by little, you find watching the movement of your feet 
and all the awareness of all the stuff which one one step needs is just amazing. And if you really get into that, you get very deep meditation. So change walking meditation, sitting meditation, eating meditation, make sure just one mouthful at a time. You don't just uh, have one mouthful and think what you're going to have next. Even if you possibly can, just put one uh, spoonful or or whatever morsel of food in your mouth and close your eyes and taste it fully. Really taste it. Enjoy it. And then swallow it. If you really enjoy your food by being aware of it and not thinking of something else, you find that you get much more saliva comes out and you digest much better. And that's one of the, I've told many people this, and there's a lot of truth to this, because I'm mindful when I eat. Just as I eat you know, probably less food than other monks, but I digest more of it. So that's why I'm fat, because my digestion is really good. <laughs> but just if you need a rest, take a rest. But try not to disturb the peace. Remember, this is only the first day. And the first day, just, you know, don't expect too much. You're building up momentum as we go through this retreat to see what happens. Don't expect anything. Try and be in the moment as much as you can. Try not to think too much. And just look for the enjoyment of a peaceful, happy abiding in this moment, in your flat, your apartment, in your little home. Okay. So there we go. Okay, lovely. Um, just one little message came in. Uh, I just want to reassure this person because yeah. they said that they were really scared when they had to put the brain in a box. So oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe you could say that that's optional. It's totally optional. Actually, you can't take your brain out and put it in a box. But it is that sometimes it's a little method. If you can, don't want to take your brain out of the box, find a little switch to turn it off. <laughs> for half an hour, quarter of an hour. It's just a way of realizing you don't have to use your brain over much. Use your mind instead. The mind is different than the brain. And the mind can protect itself, it can make decisions, but it doesn't think like the brain thinks. So it's optional, but just experiment sometimes, see what happens. You don't have to do that. If you do put your brain in the box, make sure to take it out again afterwards. <laughs> Don't leave it there. <laughs> okay. Uh, we okay. have two more minutes. So I wonder if we could just do one last question because it relates yeah, to on. the sutta. Yeah. Um, Piotr is saying, oh, Piotr, I think you know yeah. him, yes, yes, from yeah. Poland. Poland. He's saying yeah. that... Um... Jinqueer, Jinqueer, Piotr. <laughs> <laughs> that means hi. <laughs> Polish, so he's, yeah. he's asking if, um, why didn't the Buddha interfere when the monks were killing themselves? Because there were so many instances in the Pali Canon when the Buddha knew what was going on with divine ear or divine eye. So he's, he finds it hard to believe that he would let his Sangha die out like this. They was he too deep out. in meditation to notice what was happening? Exactly, yes. Because when you go into meditation, you know, you just, uh, you that in those deep meditations, you don't, uh, turn on the awareness of what's going on around you. In other words, you just the reason why he went into a retreat was to you know, have that time away you know, from all these um, the busyness of running a sangha, of running a business, running an Kampa bikini project. And so he, that was his time of rest. So when he came out afterwards, that was when he realized that the teaching he gave was misunderstood and gave them better teaching. The only reason I told that story is just to make it a bit more interesting. Something else which people don't usually hear. That no, number one, that monks, when they're not enlightened, make mistakes. And other monks, so they were enlightened, but say, okay, I'm going to die anyway, so what's the point? But there's also the fact that the idea of going on a retreat, even the Buddha did that, for the happiness and well-being of himself and so he could have the power to teach others. Okay. Thank you That's very nice much, Ajahn. Yeah. Okay.
It's all so good. I'm going to go on retreat in my my cave now. I'm going yes. to go to sleep. I've had a busy busy day. Excellent. So we can stop the recording, Mel, and yeah. uh, say goodbye to everyone on Facebook as well.